Sure, I'm here representing Sun Microsystems, which is a U.S. corporation based, a technology vendor. We're a big computer systems company. We're based in California. Um, and I am sent here to try to elevate the issue of technical standards in discussions of internet governance. Um, and, and when we when I mention technical standards, I mean just I, I mean much beyond just the core infrastructure of the internet. I'm talking about application layer standards as well, which we believe are are equally important to to the whole notion of the network. Right. So sure. Well, well. For, first of all, I'll start off by defining what I mean by by a standard. Right. So a technical standard. And by that, I'm talking about the, the interfaces at the hardware level as well as the software level that allow different components, on, that allow, allow components on either side of the interface to interoperate. And there's a whole bunch of technical ways in which these interfaces can be defined. They could be, and, and I'll just throw some terms out to you, these are such things as application programming interfaces, protocols, schemas data formats and, and, and their encodings. All these things, if, if you think about it just in, in our daily lives, it's an interface by which two sides mediate and communicate to each other. There's a whole corollary to that whole concept in the world of computing, both at a hardware level as well as at a software level. Right? So when I talk about layers in the internet, excuse me, in the internet, um, the internet itself, the architecture is built on layers. Um, and that's probably our best kind of an, an analogy for the, the composition of how things work on the internet. Um, and I'm not an engineer, and, and embarrassingly, although I work for you know, a big technology company, I can't go into much, much depth on this, but, but at the foundation layer, there are, there are both physical, you know, physical level things, as well as um, you know, standards and ways of working on top of that that provide a base level of functionality. Of, co of connectivity. And the most famous that everybody understands about the internet is just are, are the base calling protocols, TCP over, over IP, right? Above that, as you want to add additional functionality, the analogy we use in, in our mind, again, is a layer, an architecture, which, which in our reality, in our day-to-day -day lives makes sense to us. You have a foundation, you build on that, you maybe build out a window here for a particular feature, you have kids, you want to build on another story and some extra bedrooms. It's the same, same way with, with the internet and the idea of this network that it provides. The base level of functionality is provided by TCP over IP and some additional things there around security and routing and packet switching and all that kind of stuff. But as people wanted to bring to the network things that they needed to make it work for them, they added additional layers of features and functionality. So there's things around security. There are things around, um, well, certainly, again, we are talking about an application layer. There are all these things that you add that enable you, who's using one application to, say, write, write your, your best new novel and save that information. You send it to someone else. They're using an application on the other end to catch that, read it, and understand it, and do something with it. So the description, and there actually is a formalized kind of way of um, uh, describing this in, in the world of the internet, um, and I think it's seven layers that they kind of just break this out as. I should remember, I don't exactly know, but I think it's kind of several fun se seven functional layers that go from the kind of increase in complexity as you go up and in, in, in features that they add. It's relevant to internet governance because at every, every, every layer matter, matters. The entire, the entire composite picture is what makes up the internet, truly. Um, some, some, if, if a technical purist will say to you, actually, really, the internet is really only those base little layers. All that other stuff is just, I don't know what, it's the network that uses the base layer of internet to communicate. Anyway, anyways, but it matters to internet governance because this, this larger idea of the internet is what we all use to, to communicate, and it's a huge driver for economic growth, right? And it's, it's a huge um, uh, increasing component to the social aspects of our lives, certainly in the, developing world, the developed world, and increasingly in the developing world as well. Um, historically, internet governance discussions have focused on control, management, who gets to say what and do what and how around those really base level functionality. So I, I suspect you've had most of your people coming and talking today about internet governance and they've been talking about ICANN and domain naming system and, and routing and, and how that works and regional networks and things like that. What we're here for and trying to include in that dialogue is, yes, those foundational aspects are really important, but what is 
equally important to a user's experience or user's ability to use the network are these higher level things as well. Things like document formats, um, things like, um, well, the rest of it all gets kind of, well, any sort of data uh, encoding, anything, an interface around a piece of data, around a piece of information. Those are the things that are required when you send something over the network the interface around on either side of those needs to be open so that either side can actually understand it. You can actually communicate with the person on the other end of that line. Right. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely, it, it, the issues around the issues around standardization is about equitable access to information, not only equitable access to the internet itself, but then to be able to use the internet in all the ways in which it's intended to be used, which is a, is a full uh, communication vehicle, right? So it's issues of ec equitable access for certain. Um, it's also issues of, for us on the standardization side, it's also issues of competition and innovation, which then in turn leads back to improved access and more equitable access to the internet, again, and all the functions that it provides. There is no problem for, for technology vendors to go off in all sorts of different directions. Competition is good. What we're trying to say is that competition should be happening in a very focused manner on, on value-added features above those things that are required to interoperate. We don't want competition at those interfaces that are required for interoperability for two sides to communicate. When you compete in this area, you kind of dirty it up and muddy it up. Um, and it, the competition becomes lopsided and one-sided. Let me use an example, and I, I've been so hesitating to use this because I, I'm going to bring up Microsoft, <laughs> the, the, the grill in the room always, um, and it's always a bit of an uncomfortable thing to bring up, and particularly I work for some microsystems, so it always seems that we're competitive, but Microsoft just has such a huge positive um, and just a defining impact, of course, on the Internet, and the way more so on the way that we think about computing and, and use computers. But take Microsoft's Office applications, right? You can, um, that's something that's used over the internet, right? People send each other documents, presentations, spreadsheets all the time. And people don't really think about it, because generally, they, they just assume that on the other end, someone's going to be able to read that document. But if you, if you kind of break that down and parse that out a little bit, the way that Microsoft stores data in that Office application is in a set of proprietary, meaning privatized, they own it, uh, uh, specifications. It, they're not truly standards. They don't permit anybody else to see this information or to use it or to build products to it. So the only way someone can get that data is if they have a product, a Microsoft product, that adheres to that same thing. Now that works great in a world when everybody's using Microsoft products. It works beautifully well, as a matter of fact. But that's not the future of computing. The future of computing, well, the current computing, and increasingly so, is going to be very complex and very heterogeneous. There's going to be all sorts of applications out there, all sorts of users with all sorts of different requirements, all sorts of capa different capacities. Um, you, can't, you can't predict, you, you can't count on having a monoculture in, in computing. And that's what we fear is, is it, it, that we, we we're, we're fearful that we're setting up a system that is, is, is skewed towards promoting a, a, a monoculture and not understanding that there needs to be heterogeneity and that that's a good thing and that the way that you manage diversity yet still enable people to talk together basically over the network is through standards, right? I would have no problem if we took all of Microsoft's to get the technical terms here, all of the application programming interfaces, all their data formats and encodings, all the little interfaces that they have in their system, I'd be happy for those things to be established as the open standards for the world to use. And by open, I mean their creation and management is open to anybody to participate in and to have a voice in changing that. You know, hopefully that's kind of ringing some bells about governance right there, right? Yeah. Oh, by also by open, I also mean that by character, technical characteristics of, that, of, of those specifications, they can't include any uh, proprietary or technical hooks that mean it works, better, it works better on one person's platform rather than another person's platform, choice, choice of a platform. 
And then we also have the issue of intellectual property here too. By open, I also mean that open means that there are no restrictions uh, based on intellectual property law to anybody using those specifications. So if Microsoft were to take all their APIs, all this crazy stuff that makes all their different applications and their operating system work well with the hardware, it work well with all their applications and how all these things are integrated, and they push those out onto the world as o truly open standards, that would be amazing. It would, that could be such an amazing engine and driver for growth around the world. It would just be unbelievable. And what that would mean is that people would have, it, it would enable competition and choice and innovation. It means that any, kind, any company, any small three-person company in, 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 in Bangladesh or you know, some large company in Canada could read those specifications and build their own product to it and say, you know, you know say, say this uh, a company in Bangladesh that needs to make, again, back to the office document you know, uh, example, um, there are particular requirements, say, in, in the Bangladeshi local government for um, text formatting or something like that. There's something particular for their, for their culture that they need in, 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 a, in an office application. If these specifications were truly open and anybody could write to them, you know, Two high school guys in, in, in Bangladesh could, could see a business opportunity and go do that. They could build it. They could even build it in an open source community so that everybody would have an, an ability to participate in this. It's, it, that, that's sharing. That's equitable access to information. And that's tapping into massive quantities of innovation that, that we have around the world that right now we, we, we aren't. There are, and I keep hearing this again and again this week, that there are five billion people who are not connected to the internet. At, at some level, those five billion people this is not the most important issue for them, right? There's a lot more that's important. But what it could possibly enable as an open, open vehicle for communication and innovation and knowledge sharing is, is, is amazing. And when, when Sun, again, thinking of my, my, my host, the people who sent me here to, the, to this conference, when Sun thinks about those five billion people, we think a little bit about, wow, well, there'll be some sales if those people ever came online. And, you know. But what we really think is, wow, those are five billion people, and there's probably a significant portion of those people who are brilliant and who have some damn good ideas. But they're not online with us. We aren't hearing from them. We don't know what they think, and they can't participate and give those ideas back to growing this idea of the network. Well, there's, there's, again, like the internet architecture itself, right? There's many layers to the issue of access, right? There's starting from just the physical network layer of people don't have big bandwidth pipelines into their, into their small village, right? And then there's the capacity issues around, around access to and so on and so forth. But for, for what it's worth and for what Sun, for what Sun can do and, and, and is doing, there, there certainly is a lot. And I, I would say what I'm here for, again, about the standardization, open standardization aspects, we believe that's a really important part. Um, the open source software movement as well, that notion, that, that's a huge uh, element of, of, of knowledge sharing and collaboration uh, that, 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 that's completely, really truly revolutionizing com computing. Um, and, and a huge hats off to Richard Stallman, I'll put it down for posterity here, huge hats off to Richard Stallman and the, the thousands and thousands of people who have worked on that. Um, Sun is a huge supporter of, of open source software. Basically, our entire software line is, is, is under open source licenses and, and communities built around from, from developer tools to identity management products to all that fun stuff that we do, we do as a software company. We've even open sourced our hardware, and not, not to get too much in the technical stuff, but we've even open sourced and, and standardized a lot of our hard, uh, things around our hardware such that we open the market for more participants to come in. We aren't being closed about the design rules and the process around this and the fabric. Fabrication is one thing. You've got to have a lot of money to actually build some of these things, but someday that will change. And, and, and we, we, we're trying to push that change by being more open about what we do and how we do it, why we do it. Because like I said, there are five billion people out there who probably think a lot smarter than we do. <laughs> and we'd love to see those ideas, right? Um, I, I just you know the last thing from from Sun's perspective is we've been, and again not to get too much in the, the technicalities of it, but we've always long had a vision that the network itself is the compu is, is the computer, and that computing power should be a utility, it, it, and I mean that in every kind of sense of the definition that you turn on a switch and it just works and it's just there. It should be transparent. You should never even think about it. It's just there wherever you need it, just in time, just at the right amount at the right level of quality service, at the right speed, the right bandwidth, and so on. So there's a lot that we're doing 
from a hardware, and, and there's a lot of software involved in this too, to try to enable that as, as a vision. Um, and there's a lot around the aspects of delivering computing as a utility that, that means a lot to a development agenda as well, and to you know, building the, the, the pool of access to, to the network. All right. Well, in terms of, of getting getting the computer, I think, I mean, and it is happening today, it, it, often when people say that you think of the PC, you think of the laptop or that, you know, for, forget that. When people get a computer these days, they're going to get it in their, their cell phone. Or they're going to get it in, in some device. They're going to get it in, in a kiosk, perhaps. For, for, many, for many of these areas, it, it may just be, you know, one, one, one kind of kiosk in, in the center of town or in, in, in the town hall or, or whatever it is that people can come and access. It's, we don't want to be so tethered to the idea that it's this one big clunky thing and everybody's going to have one and, and own it just like in the U.S. Everybody has their own lawnmower and doesn't share it, you know. There may be a lot more of a sharing capacity that we, that we should enable here. Um, how is that going to happen? It's just, it, it, this, this sounds a bit like a like a cop out, like I'm avoiding the question, but it, but it is just happening. Just by that, but that's a general demand, and and um, there are some ways in which the market is good, and the market is, is delivering to that. Things get keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, with with more and more portability, with longer and longer battery life, which is an, which is an important thing as well. Less and less electricity or empower, power usage, and that starts to the diversification of all these kind of computing devices. I think is a good thing. That gives some flexibility to situations where everybody having a big clunky laptop that takes up a lot of power that's very expensive it is just not, not a possibility, right? So, that, so that's one thing that I think is just kind of happening that, that will improve access. And I'm not at all addressing the issue of, of bandwidth again. That's, um, I just don't know enough about that, to, to, to be honest, right? Um, but again, that innovation of, of breaking devices down to be smaller and, 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 and more diverse types, meaning, meaning more user requirements and so on. Again, I harken back, you know, I back, go back to, still these things need to be, they don't work if they aren't based on, on standards. Um, and that's the kind of core thing to making people, enabling people to work together in, in a network, you know, those areas of standards. And, you know, as for capacity building, you, yeah, that's another issue like access where there's, you know, there's a whole, 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 whole many layers to that. And I would, I'm almost uncomfortable kind of speaking on that. I'm not. From, I mean, I'm from California, you know, U.S. USA. What do I know about capacity, right? I mean, for of, of developing countries, someone from a developing country who's involved in this can speak to it much better than I can. Um, yeah. um, so I'm not really. I'm sorry. I'm really not 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 sure what to say to that for 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 capacity building. And it's I mean, it's obviously tied to education. It's obviously tied tied to cultural cultural needs too, and envir environmental needs. I don't think. That you know, my my, own, my only you know, embarrassingly to say, my only experience of being in a, if I if I may say it, phrase it this way, you know, a lesser developed country was some time I spent in Egypt. From my limited experience there, and and, and what I know of the, of the of the months I spent there, um, the people there did not need a big massive computer with all this computing power that they needed to plug in and all. They didn't need that. Um, capacity is going to come from vendors starting to su supply exactly what users need and to realize that there's a wide range of diversity in what, in what users need as well. Um, I don't think in the capacity building of, 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 the, of the citizens, they don't need to necessarily know how to install an operating system and boot up all these things and learn how to use all these 50, di 50 different type of applications. You know, the capacity can be very you know, there's a range of, 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 at application level, what do they actually need to know? There's probably going to be a whole, whole range of things, and it's going to be kind of self-selective around that. But, but all of it, that will all get kind of figured out the more access people have to what is this in the first place so they can start formulating what is it that they need and in their culture what, 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 what would be helpful to them in their culture and in their daily lives. You know, for me living, here's an example, for me living in the tech world, Silicon Valley, California, rah, 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 I need, I guess I don't really need, but you know, I need my Blackberry and I need my, you know, my ability to get email everywhere I am and on all that time to be paged anytime. I need to be able to watch my videos on this and you know, tape record off, you know, digitally record off of that. Not everybody needs that. Um, so needs are gonna are you determine what capacities um, are, are, are trying to be met.
I, 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 what's a vision? I guess, I'll, let me state my vision. My vision would be that this is driven by the users. <laughs> Governance should be driven. This, this is power to the people, by the people. People should be determining how this should, should be. Should, what governance mean? What type of governance do they need? What needs to be governed? What needs to be let, let alone? Um, I hear a lot of talk this week. It's a very irritating point for me all the time. Is is what is you know the, the market will figure this out. The market's a good mechanism. The market, 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 and I'm I'm all for a I'm all for market forces, and I do believe that that eventually they often do resolve to the best solution. But there's no such thing as a free market. Markets are always regulated, um, and I think there's a, a role for governments, of course, in that. That's what they do. They help to regulate markets, and I think they need to be absolutely tuned to what users need when they're making those decisions about where to step in and what to do. Um, um, and I think that is something that I think is an issue that's been lost a little bit in, in, a, in a lot of uh, discussions of internet governance to date, right? And I think part of that is, is again, education on the, on the side of the consumers or the users as well. It's, it's a, um, it's not exactly, it's, I'm, I'm using the wrong phrase by saying it's a collective action issue, but, it, but it's always an issue when, when you have a large dispersed crowd that needs to come together and, and make something happen. Well, it's, it's a lot easier if you have two people in the room and try to get them together and do something. That, that The bargaining power is you know, quick to come together and make, you know, make it happen. But, um, so I think it, it, it's been a hard thing for users to kind of voice what, what it is that they need and to get that to, you know, to communicate that to governments and communicate that, that to technology vendors too, especially also when it's such a new thing. I mean, I, I mean, you you probably know you never thought you needed an iPod, did you? God, now you have one. You need it, don't you? Right? And now that you have it, you never thought about the features. You 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 know, you just plop. You know, you got one for Christmas. You're like, oh, sweet. And then you're checking out the features and playing with it. And it's not until you use it you start to kind of realize what it is you need. Um, so I think that's another reason for the lag time. But as we have a population, certainly will happen in the developing world. It certainly has happened in the developed world. That's more conversant in technologies, what they want, what they're looking for. Um, you know, we are, we are seeing governments be more responsive to that, and the ideas of internet governance are, are changing about that. And I think a great example of that is in intellectual property law. Um, not to get too into that um, lovely and arcane subject, but. There, there was a time when the limitations and exceptions around copyright and, and patents were, were, were pretty stringent. Um, and and in, the, in the world of technology, um, there have been a lot of battles about this, and, and those initial battles were done by just a few people, you know, rooting for the consumer, the user in this. That's really changed as, as people are using technology more and more in their daily lives. They're really starting to understand, hey, that's, wait, I don't think that's very fair. When I buy my song off of iTunes, I play it on my iPod, I bought that thing. I, spend a buck on it, but I can't play it on my other MP3 player? That's, wait, 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 that, that doesn't make sense. And they're starting to get engaged in these things. They're starting to understand them. So I think that's, that's something that's improving. Um, so I'm not giving you a good vision, I guess, for, or, or for, for how the three, the three should work together. But I, again, I just absolutely think it needs to be driven by the users. That's what this is all about. I guess my greatest hope for the internet is that we stop talking about it, <laughs> in that it becomes just such a ubiquitous and seamless and just it's just, it's just there and it works equally well for everybody um, that we don't think about it. That it's just an enabler, which it, which it was always meant to be, which it is, and which is always really meant to be. That we don't have these big, you know, UN-sponsored, uh, you know, conferences around how should we govern the internet and how should these different, you know, actors play in it. It just is. It's just we turn it on and it's there and people don't think about it and they go about their daily lives. Yeah. Um, I guess my greatest, my greatest fear is that the internet just um, becomes like any other sort of privatized communication mechanism that we have out there. Um, that's not really, that's not really very good answer. Um, yeah, I guess I guess my concern is that the internet doesn't become the, what I hope for, which is just this basic utility for us, like 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 the free natural resources we have, and 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 that we hopefully continue to have clean air and clean water and um, you know electricity. From I hope it becomes becomes that. I'm scared that it, I'm scared that it won't. I'm scared from 
forces of confusion and um, competitive you know, business interest, break it up and fragment it and make it into um, yeah, one more thing in our world that a lot of the haves can afford and the have-nots can't. Can I use two? Diffuse and ubiquitous? <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Right. Trying to think of how I would des I'd describe it. Just kind of, I don't know, diffuse background ubiquitous. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.